Okay, let's get back at this. Okay, that one we did. What is a part 15 device? Okay. I covered this a little bit ago, part 15. It's an unlicensed device that may emit low-powered radio signals on frequencies <coughs> used by a licensed service. Anything that has a computer chip or a microprocessor in it, plus a lot of other things, will fall under part 15. Okay. Technically, even if it's a home-built piece of equipment and it emits something, it's part 15. And if the person does not cease and desist use when requested, it can go badly for them. Yeah? Could a Part 15 device be used with a, uh, like a, like a ham radio device? Like, I oh, yeah. a computer to, uh... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But it's still a Part 15 device, and if it interferes, you turn it off, okay? Uh, there was a little Santa Claus thing that had lights on it that was creating a problem in Lancaster years, years ago because it had a bad connection in it. It was generating uh, signals that wiped out police radios for about three blocks around it. Okay. Uh, one of the things, the hams found that. It was an elderly lady who had it. She was playing it for the kids. They took the thing, figured out what was wrong with it, soldered the joints, gave it back to her. And she was happy, the police were happy, and they had fun doing it. What might be a problem if you receive a report that your audio signal through the repeater is distorted or unintelligible? If they tell you they can't understand you, your transmitter could be off frequency. One of the nasty things is that you can be, you can accidentally bump a knob, turn it five kilohertz off frequency. It may still pick up the repeater and you may still be there, but it don't sound good, okay? Now that will only happen if you're running, not saving your, your stuff, saving your settings. Your batteries are running low. We've got a guy who, I'm not kidding you, he just needs to buy a new battery for his handheld, but he won't do it. And you're in a bad location. What do you do? Make sure the antenna's up, move a couple feet. All of those choices are correct. What is a symptom of RF feedback in a transmitter or transceiver? Where the RF gets back into the microphone. It can happen, by the way, on a handheld where the microphone's part of it. Usually doesn't, but it can. Reports of garbled, distorted, or unintelligible voice transmissions. You'll just not sound good. What should be the first step to resolve cable TV interference from your ham transmission? Be sure that all the coaxial connectors, TV coaxial connectors, are installed properly. We had one where this wasn't a ham interference, but the guy called me up and said, hey, I'm having trouble. My cable TV looks awful. It just keeps going in and out, in and out. Went over to his house, took a hold of the cable going into the TV, and it connect, the wire fell out of the connector. Uh, three minutes with a crimp tool and a new connector, and everything's working fine. What is the purpose of a dummy load? I know. It is to prevent transmitting signals over the air when making tests. If I want to play with a transmitter, test it, and I don't want the signals on the air, I've got, no kidding, a paint can with a connector on the top of it with a big resistor inside in oil that I connect to the transmitter. The RF goes in there it makes heat, and it doesn't go out on the air. That's how you, by the way, that's a, a way you test transmitters. Yeah. I actually think I helped you build that. Yes, you did. Okay. Which of the following, and by the way, 
I made a mistake. It would have worked pretty well without the oil. The mineral oil seeps out a couple of places and it is ugly. Okay. Which of the following instruments can be used to determine if an antenna is resonant at a desired frequency? An antenna analyzer. It, you analyze the antenna. A 19 and 3 quarter inch vertical antenna is resonant on 2 meters. That's all it takes on 2 meters for a decent antenna. It ain't a great one, but it's a decent one. If you put a little screw in the center of it, like a spring, it'll be resonant on both 2 meters and on 70 centimeters. There's a really nice antenna by Tram. If you decide to put one on your car, it's around 20 bucks. It includes the magnet, and it's not a magnet this big around. It's one that's this big that will actually stay on the car. It's 19 inches long, which means that you at least got a fighting chance of getting in a garage, or at least you can lay it down, and it'll stay there. Tram makes it. It's a Tram 1185, I believe. I have one of them that I use when I'm doing some play around. Need a, if I need an extra antenna, I throw it on the car. But an antenna analyzer is the one you use. Uh, did any of you ever do CB, where you set the SWR by playing with the antenna? One of the neat things about an antenna analyzer is you, you sweep it, and you find out the frequency is low, it isn't that doing the SWR high and low and playing with it. And by the way, that's another tool that if you need one, you can usually get it with an instructor on how to use it if you just check it at the local ham club. Okay? Uh, I have one. Uh, I've gone out and tested antennas for people. What in general terms is the standing wave ratio? It's the measure of how the load, the antenna, is matched to the transmission line. If that thing isn't matched the whole way up, the signal comes back, or a certain amount of it comes back, and it causes trouble. Number one, it doesn't go out on the air, which is what you want. And number two, it heats your transmit chips. Neither one's good. <coughs> what reading on an SWR meter indicates a perfect impedance mismatch between the antenna and the feed line? One to one. If it's one to one, that's perfect. Rarely do you ever see one to one. It's usually 1.05 to one if you get real close. Why do most solid state amateur radio transmitters reduce output power as the SWR increases? to protect the RF output or the output of amplifier transistors. Most transmitters, if, you see, if it sees an SWR of two to one or worse, which start to get bad, it'll quarter the output power. So instead of transmitting at 50 watts, you may get 12. Plus the fact that you're not batching, which means that the 12, a good bit of it isn't even going out. So, it's a bad scene all around. What does an SWR reading of 4 to 1 indicate? An impedance mismatch. It is a problem. What happens to power lost in the feed line? When you have an impedance mismatch, that power is coming back. Some of it's getting lost in the feed line. Some of it's hitting the, the transmitter. Power lost in the feed line is converted to heat. Any place you create heat, you're creating a problem. You will eventually cook the, the coax to where it's not good because you slowly heat the insulation and it slowly deteriorates. What instrument other than an SWR meter could you use to determine if a feed line and antenna are properly matched, feed line and antenna improperly matched are properly matched is a directional watt meter. Don't buy one. 
An antenna analyzer costs about four or $500. A directional watt meter price starts in thousands. And then you have to buy slugs for every frequency. It is a laboratory piece of equipment. It is not the kind of equipment that the average ham has. Most likely SMRA owns one. <coughs> I know that KVHF does. If you really need that, usually you can either borrow it or take your transmitter in and they'll help you with it. I would imagine John J. Manette has one. Several. <laughs> uh, we bust on John. He's a good guy. But to be honest with you, he has enough money that he sometimes spends it a little more frivolously than I would. Okay, we're talking about coaxial cable. This is the stuff that you get to connect your transmitter to the antenna. It comes in diameters that are smaller than that mic cable up to stuff that's a couple of inches in diameter. Of course, the thicker it is, the better it is, and the thicker it is, the more it costs. When you get up to two and a half inch hard line, which is what a coax, which is this stuff, like here, uh, $10 a foot, maybe even more. 100 foot run is a nice chunk of change. Actually, I think probably a lot more than $10 a foot in some cases. Okay. This is kind of the stuff that we would typically use here. Uh, I believe that is a piece of RG8X. It's got a foam core. It's got a nice braid on the outside that's solid braid. If you take some of the cheaper coax apart, you'll find out that half of the area is open space with the braid around it. That isn't real good. And it's got a nice solid center. The air core, look at that, that's a pipe in the center. Remember I said about skin effect? The RF runs on the et outer? Well, a pipe is less copper that has the same effect. The outside is again a corrugated pipe. They're nice copper, expensive. And to keep them separate, so that we don't have a much, lot of plastic in there, because the plastic actually degrades the signal more. All they have is a little separator that keeps them apart. Now, this stuff can be bent about like that without damaging it. This stuff, mm -hmm, you know, nice big sweeping bend, very careful. If you want to see some of this, go to where there's a cell tower and look at the cable that goes up. That's hard line. <coughs> Which is the following is the most common cause of failure of coaxial cables? Moisture contamination. This is very susceptible to moisture. A lot of airspace in there. This, if it gets through this jacket and gets in here, it's bad news. Why should the outer jacket of coaxial cable be resistant to ultraviolet light? Ultraviolet light can damage the jacket and allow water to enter the cable. The ultraviolet light isn't the problem, the, the water that gets in because of it. We just took down an antenna at my house a couple months, a couple weeks ago, that had white coax up to it. White coax is almost never ultraviolet resistance. If it's black, it probably is. But if it's white, it almost certainly isn't. That stuff cracked and broke. Uh, I had water in it. I know I did. The new <coughs> antenna that I put back up with the new coax is working much better. Hmm. wonder why. But ultraviolet light damaged the jacket. I, I see every once in a while someone strings a piece of coax along the edge of a house that's white so that it doesn't isn't noticeable. And I chuckle. What is the disadvantage of air cooled <coughs> coaxial cable when compared to foam or solid dielectric types? Air core, foam. Yeah. It requires special techniques 
to prevent water absorption. If there is a pinhole anywhere in this, every time the temperature goes up and down, it sucks moist air in, sucks moist air in, and, the and it winds up with water in it. Okay. What does a dummy load consist of? Remember I said dummy load burns it off? Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It has to be changed to another state. You have RF energy. You put it into a big resistor. It turns it into heat. It's a non-inductive resistor and a heat sink. You put 100 watts of heat into a small space, and it's going to get hot. It's going to burn out the resistor. So you need something to take the heat away. Which instrument would you use to measure electrical potential or electromotive force? What, what are you measuring? You're measuring voltage. It's a voltmeter. I need to look at something. Ah, good. Okay. I forgot where I'm at. What is the correct way to connect a voltmeter to a circuit? A voltmeter goes in parallel. You connect the, the plus to the plus and the minus to the minus, and you take a look. And you re measure the voltage because you're measuring the pressure, the electrical pressure. You're not measuring the flux. That would have to break it and just look at it. If you think about this in the old, my nice water example, it makes a lot of sense real easy. How is a simple ammeter connected in a circuit? Now, ammeter is measuring the flow. You can't measure the flow unless you can look at the flow. You have to break the circuit and you connect it in here in series with the circuit. Uh, that's a fun one. Which instrument is used to measure electric current and ammeter? Measure amps. Okay. What instrument is used to measure resistance? An ohm meter. Now, just say this. I honestly don't know where you would buy an ohm meter today. Because, I think it's the next question you buy a multimeter that will measure voltage and ohms, or resistance. But, which of the following might damage a multimeter? Shoot, I should have brought my idea. Attempting to measure voltage when it's in a resistance setting. You have it set to measure resistance, and you decide to stick the probes in the wall socket to see what the voltage is, and it will, it will damage it. Most of them have fuses in them that are supposed to blow. And sometimes they do. And sometimes they don't. Which of the following measurements are commonly made using a multimeter? Voltage and resistance. The multimeter, by the way, if you do not have one, I don't care if you're a ham operator or not, if you don't have one, that is one of the most useful tools around a home and a car if you're having problems is a, a multimeter. And Harbor Freight sells a junk one for, what is it, three bucks? And sometimes they'll give you they give one. You free one if you buy something. Yeah, sometimes yeah. You yeah, yeah I know. I've got two of them. Yeah, my son just one of these Yeah. Because there's so many things you can do with it. Okay? If you don't have one, it's a, it's a beautiful tool to have. A light isn't working. One quick check and you know what's wrong with it. Uh, the only thing I will say is we're going to talk about safety in doing that. There are some things that you do not want to use it for. And the Harbor Freight one, I will not use at voltages above 200 volts. Okay? The probes on it are probably good for 1,000, but I don't want to find out that they're not. Okay? Which of the following types of solder is best used for radio and electronic use? It is called rosin core solder. It's actually looks like a wire, it's, it's solder. But if you cut it, you'll find out that there's a little hole down the center that contains a rosin compound. 
The one thing that is required to solder or weld is clean. Now I know when you look at the dirt around a welding shop, you say clean. No, it has to be clean. That, con that has to be clear metal with no oil or no grease or soap on it. And one of the things a rosin will do is clean that off. Helps you, helps you solder. Yeah, yeah, the word flux is used uh, with most other, other thing other than the word rosin. And, uh, okay. What is the characteristic appearance of a cold solder joint? A grainy or a dull surface. If you look at a solder joint, and, and I'll tell you what, a lot of times if you open a piece of equipment and take a quick look, you can see problems. If the solder joint looks pretty, smooth, rounded, you know, not like a bead on a wind of water on a windshield, but where the water's flowing. If it looks like it's done that, it's a good joint. If it's grainy, if it's rough, if it's ragged, the person didn't do it right. And I've opened piece of equipment that was acting funny, looked down over the board, pulled the soldering iron out, hit two joints, turned it back on and everything was fine. I'll tell you a real horror story. I have a really good power supply. It has six transistors in it that control the output voltage. They're tied together because they need six of them to handle the current. It blew the rectifier for some reason or another. No idea. So I got it open. Normally, I don't open things and look at them unless I got a problem. Why? You may create another problem. I opened it. I, I checked the rectifier. It was burned out. And I'm sitting here looking at this, the circuit, and three of the transistors weren't even hooked up. This thing was working, and working well. Fortunately, however, I was only running about 10 or 12 watts out, or 10 or 12 amps, instead of the full 30 that it was capable of. So I wasn't overtaxing those transistors. But had I started trying to run 30 amps, I'd have burned, burned out three of the transistors. Uh, when I have anything open, I do do a look around. What is probably happening when an ohm meter connected across an unpowered circuit? Now this, we'll do some thinking about this, just let's read the question first. What's probably happening when an ohm meter connected across an unpowered circuit initially indicates a low resistance, like maybe 10 ohms, and then slowly shows an increasing resistance with time, and eventually gets up to maybe 30,000 ohms. But it just slowly comes up. The circuit contains a large capacitor. What happens when you first hit it? An ohm meter actually puts voltage through the circuit to measure the, the, the resistance. When you put it on there, that capacitor is uncharged. Initially, it will take a lot of current to try to charge it. But as it slowly takes, gets charged, it takes less and less. And that thing will start out real high and then go down. And the way to check if that's what it is, is you put a shorting bar across for a second, discharge the capacitor, put it back on and it will do the same thing. A capacitor, now, what does that mean to also in another light? If you have an item that has high voltage in it, and there's a capacitor in there and it's charged, you turn it off, there's still high voltage there. Yeah. Now, supposedly, there are what are called bleeder resistors in there that will take it down in a few minutes. But if the bleeder resistor burns out, there's no indication it burned out until you stick your fingers in there and wind up sitting back on the floor, which I've done once or twice. 
not with that, but I have sat on the floor and looked and reevaluated what I just did. Which of the following precautions should be taken when measuring circuit resistance with an ohmmeter? We talked about this. You can burn out the ohmmeter if you hook it to a circuit that's powered. Make sure that the circuit's not powered. <coughs> Which of the precautions should be taken when measuring high voltage with a voltmeter? You ensure that the voltmeter and the leads are related for use, are rated for the use at the voltages measured. This is what I just said about this Harbor Freight one. I like it. I've got two of them. I can bounce them around in the car. I don't have to worry if I break one. But I won't use it at over 200 volts because I'm not comfortable with it. None of you, unless you have special trade, should be playing with voltages over 200 volts with a meter without training. Because quite frankly, there are too many ways to get hurt. If one of you goes out and does something that gets hurt that I haven't covered in this, I'm wrong. And it's one of the things that I will cover in the next couple of hours quite heavily. Which of the following is a form of amplitude modulation? Most of what we use as technicians is FM. But there is AM that you're allowed to use. And one of the forms is single sideband. Everything that I do above 50 megahertz, you are allowed to do. I own the highest class license, but you have the same privileges above 50 megahertz that I do. Which, what type of modulation is commonly used for VHF packet radio transmission? FM. We send packets of information. We'll be talking about a couple of those if we go on. It's data. It's just like the packets that go across the internet. Their format is a little different, but it's the same idea. Which type of voice mode is often used for long distance, weak signal contacts on the UHF and VHF bands, single side band. FM is great where you've got good signals, but not where you've got weak ones. Remember also that FM uses vertical polarization. Side band usually uses the horizontal polarization. Which, of, which type of modulation is commonly used for VHF and UHF voice repeaters? FM. Most of our repeaters are FM. And you can tell the DRM guys those are too. Which of the following types of emission has the narrowest bandwidth? CW. You can put more CW stations in a band than anything else. Which side band is usually is normally used for 10 meter HF, VHF, and UHF single side band communications? Upper. The higher frequencies use upper, the lower frequencies use lower. Okay? okay. Actually, the break isn't there, it's a little lower. But why? It's a convention. That's what we've used. And oh, by the way, I will tell you, there is a technological reason that existed in 1960 when that convention started. Many conventions that you look at and you say, why? When you go back to the, where it started, there, there's a reason. It had to do with the way sideband was being created. What is an advantage of single sideband over FM voice transmissions? Single sideband has a narrower bandwidth, 15 kilohertz for FM, Somewhere between 2.3 and 3 for sideband. What is the approximate bandwidth of a single sideband voice signal? 3 kilohertz. What is the approximate bandwidth of a VHF repeater phone signal? Between 10 and 15 kilohertz. 
One of the neat things about this is the wideband FM could send uh, hard, hard monitors. I know that there's some problems with narrow FM with sending those. Not sure how that's been addressed. What typical? What is the typical bandwidth? Uh, read this together. Analog fast scan TV transmissions on the 70 centimeter band. They are six megahertz wide. A TV channel wouldn't fit in the two meter band. It does fit. In the, in the 70 centimeter, which starts down around 100 or 430 and goes up to 450. Uh, does anyone know what analog fast scan TV transmissions are? They're the NTSC TV that we used from 1940s until we went to digital. Yeah, it's a standard analog signal. Yeah, it's a standard analog old TV. Okay, that's what fast scan TV is. It, it's the one where you have to bend the antennas the right yeah, way. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. <laughs> but we've been we've been doing it for about 55, 60 years. We use that system. And it's gone now, right? All that bandwidth is reallocated. Yes, yes. One of the neat things is. Those six megahertz TV channels, if you take a look, channel eight is eight one, eight two, eight three, and eight four. They could actually do four channels in there. Although I'm not sure that all four of them can be full 10, 1080 HD. There's just not enough bandwidth to do that. But what we've done is we've cut the number of six megahertz channels. Uh, channel 15 no longer has a transmitter up in Lebanon. They're being transmitted somewhere else or another. I've forgotten which one. Uh, we've cut down some of the RF. What is the approximate maximum bandwidth required to transmit a CW signal? Although they talk about the 500, really? You can do a CW signal at 150, and you can space them about 150 if the people have the good equipment to both send and receive. The transmitter cannot drift and has to be on frequency, and the receiver has to have really good selectivity, that is, be able to get rid of the other ones. Compare and contrast that to the other question, because I'm trying to remember what, I know the answer was 500, but what was the question? What is the, the normal bandwidth? The normal bandwidth yeah. is 500, but um, is normal 500 hertz. Yes, 500 hertz. But it's half, half, a, half a kilohertz. Yeah. The more I can get you to think, when you think 500 hertz, you also think half a kill hurts. The more I can get you to that thinking, the more of these questions you will get right when you have to do those, those things. It becomes second nature. What telemetry information is typically transmitted by satellite beacons? If you have a satellite that has nothing but a beacon on it, or it has a beacon, Normally, the health and the status of the satellite, how hot is the electronics, how good is the battery, uh, you know, those kind of things. It's just, it's, a, it's a, a health thing. What is the impact of too much effective radiated power on a satellite uplink? It can block the access for the other users. If you're sending too much power up to a satellite, if you're running, say you run a thousand watts talking to a satellite, you're going to block out other users. If you run, <laughs> one of the things you've got to realize, that satellite may be up there at 200 miles, but it doesn't take much RF to get up there because it's clear. Line it's, of sight, it's, a, it's line of sight, nothing in the road. 
Uh, the school thing that I talked about with the uh, the ISS, the usual radio for talking to them is a handheld. The with a normal whip antenna. No, it's got a special antenna. Okay. okay, you need an antenna that does this, but it. The one, the, the preferred radio is a Yeshu FT60 that sells for about 140 bucks. The antenna costs about half of that. But it isn't, now, you don't need much power to get up and back. The, the station on the ISS, I believe, is a 40 water. Which of the following are provided by satellite tracking programs? Maps showing the real-time position of the satellite track over the Earth, the time, azimuth, the elevation of the start, maximum altitude, and the end of a pass. This is, what this is, is, is it tells you where the satellite's going to come up, what path it's going to take over you, and when it's going to go down, the time, the locate, the azimuth, everything. These tracking programs tell you everything. It's specialized. I have never brought one of them up to look at one of them because I'm not interested in it. All of those choices are correct. What mode of transmission is commonly used by amateur radio satellites? They use all of them. There isn't, there isn't anything that's preponderant. What is a satellite beacon? A transmission from a satellite that contains status information. Which of the following are inputs to a satellite tracking program? Just remember that. It's the big word that starts with a K. It's, I think it's pronounced Keplerian. Basically what it is, is it's the satellite's apogee, highest point, perigee, the declination of its, it's all the stuff about its path. Because all of that has to go in. Now, you don't have to enter because all you have to do is pick the satellite you want and they're already in the program. Somebody, yes, has to enter them, but, you know. With regard to satellite communications, what is Doppler shift? Do you know what Doppler shift is used for in police? Uh, radar. Radar! Okay. As a, as a, as something approaches you with a transmitter, the frequency goes up. As it goes away, it goes down. Now, these guys have their hair dryers and they point that down. <laughs> By the way, I only ever had one speeding ticket in my life. And it was a week after I bought a new car. And I just wasn't attuned to the fact that I was driving as fast as I was. I looked down and said, oh shit, because I knew that he had it. I <coughs> he walked up to the car and he says, do you know why I'm stopping you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I wasn't even in a hurry. But what happens as the car approaches, the signal goes out. It gets compressed there. And then as it comes back, it's being compressed here. So there's a frequency shift. And all that radar gun measures is how much that frequency shifts. It's called Doppler shift. You can hear the same thing with audio if you're sitting along a, a railroad crossing and a train goes past blowing the whistle. You'll hear it go up and down. It's called Doppler shift. It's an observed change in signal frequency caused by a relative motion between the satellite and the Earth station. It's a big explanation for the fact that it's moving towards you or moving away and the frequency changes. What is, uh, okay, what is meant by the statement that a satellite is operating in UV mode? It is not ultraviolet. The satellite uplink is in the 70 centimeter band and the downlink is in the two meter band. Why is that called UV? 
What'd you say? UHF, VHF. That's exactly right. 70 centimeters is UHF. Two meters is VHF. So it's, if it was VU mode, you'd be going 70 up and, okay? I don't even know if that exists. What causes spin fading of satellite signals? Rotation of the satellite and its antenna. If the satellite is stable, your signal is stable. But if that thing happens to be rotating or spinning, the antenna is going to change attitude and it's going to sometimes go behind it. You're not going to get the same signal. It's going to go up and down. Satellites normally are stabilized pretty well when they go up. As time goes on, things will happen. <laughs> this is one. What do the initials LEO tell you about an amateur satellite? By the way, LEO is usually law enforcement officer. But it's in low Earth orbit. Low Earth orbit is usually a couple hundred miles max. Those are the ones that go around every 90, 120, 150 minutes. As opposed to the geosynchronous ones that sit out there and they're at the same place. <laughs> I laugh at that because people say they're at well, the same place. They're doing tens of thousands of miles an hour. But relative to us, they're in the same place. Who may receive telemetry from a space station? Anyone who can receive the telemetry signal. If you've got a receiver for it. By the way, there's some really neat stuff now that a simple antenna and a, trans, a transceiver that's ham that will receive out of band stuff, stuff that's not ham, you can receive satellite images from the weather satellites. Hook it up to your computer. You can sit there and watch the weather maps before WGAL puts them on the air. Which of the following is a good way to judge whether your uplink power is neither too low or too high? Your signal strength on the downlink should be the same, about the same as the beacon. The satellite will have a beacon. If you listen to it and you listen to your signal coming down, look at the strength on it, the little bar graph. If they're the same, you're at the right power. Okay. Which of the following methods is used to locate sources of noise, interference, or jamming? I talked about this a little yesterday. It's called radio direction finding. If, you, if you're a connoisseur of the old World War II movies, you've seen the Nazi van with the little loop on the top going around looking for the, the resistance, that was radio direction finding. They would look for the transmitters, okay? We do it today a little bit differently, but same idea. You get a line, you go down the road, you get another line, you put it on the map, you draw two lines, and you say, that's where it's at. And if you get there and you can't find it, you take two more lines and see. You, you're basically getting closer. Uh, by the way, if you ever have any need for that, get to us. I've got a real good one. I've got a real good antenna for that. Uh, which of the which of these items would be, <coughs> oh, while I'm thinking about it, many of the what do you call them, uh, retirement homes that have Alzheimer's patients. Some of them are starting to ban them with the transmitter. Alzheimer's patients are also creative in taking them off. Okay? You find the transmitter and it's laying somewhere and they're gone. But we do have the ability to, to locate those too. Uh, some of the police departments have bought them. They're horribly expensive when you consider that my antenna and radio together cost less than $150. Okay? Uh, many of the police scanners, the old scanners, I'm talking the old ones, 
will pick up the frequency. And then all you need is a directional antenna. One operating activity involves contacting as many stations as possible during a specified period, contesting. You get on the air and you try to see how many people you can talk to. Sometimes there's rules like how many counties, how many states, but it's that. Which of the following is a good procedure when contacting another station during a radio contest? Send only the minimum information needed for proper identification and the context exchange. If he's a real contester, I'm not. I don't care. I get on. I spend some time having fun. I'm a little bit ADHD. After about an hour of that, I've had enough. Okay? I may get back on three hours later and do another half hour. We have one guy who actually spent so much time on the air and driving that he wrecked his car by going to sleep. Okay? That's going over the edge the other way. But send only the minimum information because, quite frankly, if you try to ask them what the weather is or anything else, they will get hostile in some cases. What is a grid locator? Any of you familiar with Universal Transverse Locator? I believe it's called UTM. It's the system the military is now using rather than Latin law. That's two sets of numbers. Okay. They divide the world into, into triangles or rectangles. It's one degree by two degrees, I believe. It's a letter number designator designator assigned to a geographic location. My home is FM 19 OX. Okay. I can send six characters and the guy on the other end knows where I'm at. Now that encompasses about seven or eight homes in my neighborhood. It's not me, but it's that neighborhood. If I tack the next two on, it's my living room. I don't know what they are, but if I, if I had the next two in, in uh, eight characters, I can get down to a space the size of my living room. By the way, there's a website out there. You type your address in, and it'll tell you where you're at. How is access to some IRLP nodes accomplished? IRLP is the Internet Relay Linking Protocol. We talked about it yesterday. It's accessed by using DTMF signals. DTMF is touch tone. It's the numbers on your pad. And you hit that and you get the node. There is also something else called echo link. If you are in a Nazi prisoner of war camp, and need to work with a radio, you can, using your laptop or your computer headset, over Echo Link, you can access repeaters. I can actually take my laptop and I can access a repeater in Southern California if it has Echo Link capability. And there are literally thousands of them that do over the world. I could ac access a, a repeater in London and talk like I was on the air there. Phenomenal system. IRLP is similar to Echo Link. What is meant by voice over IP, voice over internet protocol as used in amateur radio? It's a method of delivering communications over the internet using digital means. Some of these repeater interconnections are VoIP. What is the Internet Relay Linking, Radio Linking pro Protocol, IRO? A technique to connect amateur radio systems, such as repeaters, over the Internet using I voice over IP protocol. How might you obtain a list of active nodes that use VoIP? Good question. Subscribing to an online surface from an online repeater list 
or from a repeater directory. If you go out and just search IRLP list or something like that, you'll get lists. They're all over the place. Do not buy a repeater directory unless you just really want something to hold down your pressed flowers or something. Okay? By the time it goes to print, it's out of date. Okay? By the time you get it, you know, if you want a historic document, that's good. What must be done before you use the Echo Link system to communicate your, using a repeater? You must register your call sign and provide proof of license. If you even think you might want to use Echo Link, as soon as you get your license, print out a copy of it. And I forget, search Echo Link, there's a way to get. I forget what it is now. I did it eight years ago, ten years ago. But you mail them, I think it has to be snail mail. You mail them your license, and they'll send you back a password that you need to connect. It's so that non amateurs cannot connect. Because the moment you connect, you are turning on a repeater somewhere just the same as if it was the local SMRA repeater, the HT. But it, it's a, I have had it for 10 years. I've probably used it four or five times. Every time it's been something that's really helpful. I would suggest you do this, which is what I did. I got it, I loaded it up, I went on, I tested it to make sure I knew how to use it. And then it didn't get used for probably two years. What name is given to an amateur radio station that is used to connect another, to connect other amateur stations to the internet? This is a term that's used in all kinds of networking. If it connects two dissimilar networks, it's called a gateway. I have one of them at home. Which of the following is a digital communications mode? Packet radio, yes. Packet is not as extensively used today as it was. IEEE 802.11. Does anybody happen to know what that is? It's Wi-Fi. It's the official name of Wi-Fi. Standard. Yeah, it's the standard, yeah. The official standard. And JT65 is another digital mode. It's one of the ones that uses very short packets and very noise insensitive. All of those are correct. I will tell you, some of this is so much fun if you get into it, that you just, you can, you can spend a lot of time learning things. One of the neatest things, as far as I'm concerned in ham radio, is being able to get on the air and you talk to somebody who has a different skill set, knowledge base than you do, and you get an opportunity to learn. To me, that's that's been the biggest thing over the years. What does the term APRS mean? It is the Automated Packet Reporting System. Did I mention the system for locating SAGs when we do? Uh, Okay, if I did, I have an APRS transmitter in my car. I plug it in and turn it on at times. For security reasons, I do not run it a lot. Because it sends out messages every time I turn a corner or stop or start, or every two minutes if I don't, if I'm running a straight stretch, that tells me exactly where I'm at. GP, uh, Latin long accurately, goes into a gateway and it's on the web. You can tell where my car is, okay? Needless to say, I do not run that all the time. I don't like people to exactly have that piece of information. However, when I'm running SAG on a bike race, bike ride, I want them to know I'll take the risk for an hour. Okay. 
but it's called the automatic packet reporting system. It allows you to send a packet and it gets sent repeated and into the database. It's a lovely system, but like I said, I don't run it much. I'll run it every couple months, I'll turn it on to make sure it's still working. Which of the following devices is used to provide data to the transmitter when sending automatic position reports from a mobile amateur radio station? How do you determine where you're at? A GPS receiver. If you take a look at my car, there's a little black thing sitting on top of the radio. It's the GPS receiver. What type of transmission is indicated by the term NTSC? It is the analog fast scan color TV signal. The national, I'm not sure what it is now. It's been too long. But it's the old television system that we used for 60 years. <coughs> National Television Standards Code. I think that's right, yeah. What is the, which of the following is an application of the APRS automatic packet reporting system providing a real-time tactical digital communications in conjunction with a map showing the locations of the station? Some of the APRS units, and mine has it, if I connect a keyboard, I can actually type in a 12 or 14 character message and send it. But I don't use it. I don't. Okay. Uh, let's take a break here. Let's get back at 10.30. I need to swap a memory chip. Bye.